what people are talking about when they talk about apartheid, and this is to Andy's point a minute ago, right, about the uh, Israeli, Arab, West Bank, Palestinian distinction, um, which, you know, I mean, obviously it's the same people. It's just like whether you, which side of the line you ended up on after the war in 1948, um, that, uh, that, yeah, it's true that, um, you know, so-called Israeli Arabs, right? Palestinian families who ended up on the Israeli side of the line after the initial war in 1948 were eventually granted mostly equal rights in Israel, certainly Israeli citizenship. Uh, that history is a little bit more complicated than people let on. They were actually collectively, like the entire group was under martial law for like the first 19 years of Israel's existence. But uh, that was that was lifted, you know, in 1966. And uh, I guess that's 18 years, sorry. Uh, but um, that's, uh, but yeah, that's true. And there is a lot that you could actually say about discrimination against uh, the Israeli Arab population. Uh, certainly in terms of things like housing and land use, there's a lot of discrimination that would not be legal, for example, against minority groups in the United States. It would violate the Civil Rights Act. That's perfectly legal in Israel. Uh, restrictive housing covenants. Uh, there's something called the Jewish National Fund, which uh, controls uh, actually a really substantial amount of the land in the country that is quite open about having discriminatory policies about who can lease uh, land, which uh, makes me feel slightly ill because there's like a bagel place I used to uh, really love in uh, in my hometown that had a little JNF box to you know put a coin in. And, you know, I can remember just thinking nothing of it, putting my tip in there. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, um, but in any case, uh, this, uh, so, and also um, the political participation uh, of Israeli Arabs uh, has actually been really limited. Uh, there is a document that's put out by the Israeli human rights group, uh, B'Tselem, uh, called Not a Vibrant Democracy, This is Apartheid. Uh, we can stick a link in the show notes uh, where they uh, they make the point that one of the points they make is that Israel has an electoral commission that basically decides if you're allowed to participate in elections uh, that has a history. And there have been all kinds of like, you know, it's a complicated history. Sometimes the Supreme Court has said, no, you're going too far. You have to let these people participate. But uh, they uh, but. One of the things they do is they say, yeah, if you're too anti-Zionist, you're not allowed to participate in uh, in elections, right? You know, that you're questioning the basic foundations of uh, of the state. And there actually have been lots of Israeli Arab parties and politicians who've been disqualified on that count. Uh, so you put that together with the housing and land use discrimination, uh, with the, uh, the ban. Uh, this is true on, um, you know, if you are you know, again, one of these Palestinian families that ended up on the Israeli side of the line and you get married to a Palestinian on the other side of the line, you're not allowed to live together as a married couple in Israel, allegedly for security reasons. Uh, I think pretty obviously for demographic ones. Uh, so there is actually quite a bit you can say about discrimination against Israeli Arabs, but also look, pretend that wasn't true, right? Pretend that Israeli Arabs had completely equal rights in every way to Israeli Jews, Right completely fucking irrelevant this is um yeah you know this is like yeah the thing that makes it apartheid when people are talking about apartheid they're not thinking of the israeli arabs they're thinking of the west bank and uh the the point here it's yeah it's not true that every single arab has been denied citizenship rights in israel because they're ethnicity but it doesn't follow that no arabs are denied citizenship rights in israel because of their ethnicity right for Israel has stayed in the West Bank for 57 years. Uh, it's the current official position of the Israeli government, right? Netanyahu says this all the time, that there will never under any circumstances be a Palestinian state. Israel has been building cities full of its own citizens in the West Bank for 57 years. Uh, if you are one of those settlers in the West Bank, you're considered for every legal purpose to live in Israel, not to live abroad. Um, yet the Palestinians who live there don't have citizenship rights. Why not? Well, because when you combine them with the Israeli Arabs, there would be too many Arab citizens of Israel to undermine its character as a Jewish state. This is the this is not my paranoia here. This is something that Israeli politicians will say in so many words all the time. And it's right? true. They only occupy. They only. There's only like five. What is it? Five percent of his of non. Yeah, about yeah, about five percent of Israeli Jews. Uh, a little actually. 
it's more than 5% at this point, but yeah, about 5% of Israeli Jews, uh, between five and 10%, depending on which numbers you believe live in West bank settlements. Uh, it's so, uh, so yeah. And you know, of course those people, again, they're treated as living in Israel, not living abroad. Uh, you could, uh, they could, um, uh, <laughs> you know, I mean, I always think of like, if my dad maybe lost his mind, and decided that he was going to exercise his right under the right of return. I'm not sure if I could myself, I might have to do some sort of chain migration scenario, but uh, in, uh, in any case, uh, if he did, right, he could move straight to the West Bank uh, and, uh, you know, as, as his initial destination, right? And, you know, and and be considered to have, to have done the thing, to have moved, uh, have, uh, to, have moved to, to Israel. Uh, that's... Um, and, you know, and he'd be able to vote in Israeli elections. Uh, if you were accused of a crime, he'd be tried in a real civilian court, not a military court, right? And, of course, his Palestinian neighbors would lack all of these rights, right? So, you know, that is what people are talking about when apart- they talk about apartheid. And it seems to me that the shoe fits. Um, I know we're running out of time. We need, we need to get Anders and Freddie on, but uh, let's... Uh, let's do at least the first, uh, let's see if we have time for the second, but let's do at least uh, uh, the first of the other, the clips from the other debate. It sounds cold to say it, but war is tragic and civilians die. There is no war that this has not happened in, in the history of all of humankind. The statement that Israel might take care not to target civilians is not incompatible with a diary entry from someone who said they saw civilians getting killed. I think that sometimes we do a lot of weird games when we talk about international humanitarian law or laws that govern conflict, where we say things like civilians dying is a war crime or civilian homes or hospitals getting destroyed is necessarily a war crime or is necessarily somebody intentionally targeting civilians without making distinctions between military targets or civilian ones. I think that when we analyze different attacks or when we talk about the conduct of a military, I think it's important to understand, uh, it, like, prospectively from the unit uh, of analysis of the actual military committing the acts, what's happening and what are the decisions yeah. being made, rather than just saying retrospectively, oh, well, a lot of civilians died, not very many, you know, military people died, comparatively speaking, so uh, it must have been war crimes, especially when you've got another side, um, I'll fast forward to Hamas, that intentionally attempts to induce those same civilian numbers, because Hamas is guilty of any war crime that you would potentially accuse, and this is according to Amnesty International, people that Norm loves to cite, Hamas is guilty of all of these same war crimes, of them failing to take care of the civilian population, of them essentially utilizing human shields to try to fire rockets free from attacks. Essentially? Um, essentially, yes. If, uh, me... As in, I'm just saying that yeah. essentially, yeah, as in terms of how international law defines it, not how Amnesty International defines it, but Amnesty International describes times of human shielding, but they don't actually apply the correct international legal you standard. You don't know what's the correct I know, absolutely. You no, haven't but, but, the correct. No, I absolutely You haven't the correct. I absolutely I, I, I think, but, but, um, but I'm just saying, I'm just saying, I'm just saying, believe it or not, Norm, the entire Geneva Convention is all on Wikipedia. It's a wonderful okay, website. You know but I'm just saying, I'm just saying that on the Hamas side, if there's an attempt to induce this type of military activity, attempt to induce civilian harm, that is not just enough to say, like, well, here's a diary entry where a guy talks about how tragic. See, I think the are. problem. I think yeah. the problem with, with, with your statement, is that if you go back and listen to it, the first part of it is war is hell, civilians die. It's it's a fact of life, and 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 you state that in a very factual matter. Then when you start talking about Hamas, all of a sudden you've discovered morality. I, I just love Norm just shouting out, you can't find that on Wikipedia. <laughs> I, mean, I think I'm going to start using yeah. that. So uh, also, like, there are lots of myths about how Israel doesn't target civilians or even just confusion cast about whether they target civilians. And they often just make the argument themselves they'll talk they'll point to their high precision technology and intelligence information about they know exactly who they're targeting and then it's like okay so then you knew that you were targeting a bunch of civilians if you had all this intelligence um yeah uh, and it's also like i i, I think where this really the reason, the reason becomes that, most most obviously absurd is with the displacement that um that you know you like you make all the like war is hell rhetorical moves you want but like you don't displace 85 percent of the population from their homes by mistake i totally agree with that but i think we both agree that's not what destiny's thinking about (laughs) he's thinking about the surface level of uh of uh 
of of civilian de- of casualties basically and um and so yeah to argue that um there's all these different reasons why i mean first of all let's just look at in operation cast lead which was the smallest of the mowings of the lawn since uh the early 2000 or no and i mean yeah. uh, since, so, sorry until now until now yeah. uh uh so it was the biggest at the time, but smallest now, um, uh, except for Pillar of Defense, um, where uh, it was scandalous how many people were killed, how many civilians were killed. There were human rights watch uh, or human rights uh, humanitarian organizations all around the world that documented on it uh, and investigated it. And you had, uh, I think, a thousand civilians and 350 children and 6,000 homes destroyed. And then in Operation Protective Edge, it was uh, 550 children and around 2,000, I think, civilians killed and 18,000 homes destroyed. And in those instances, there are many humanitarian, uh, not even humanitarian organizations, even with Israel, there's an uh, organization called Breaking the Silence that interview that uh, uh, does basically uh, transcripts of interviews with uh, Israeli soldiers uh, who participated in each of these things. And we're just talking about cast lead and uh, protective edge now, which are fractional, uh, right. marginal compared to what's happening now. And we're scandalous then. Um, after protective edge, the head of the Red Cross, and a lot of this I'm getting from Finkelstein's last book on Gaza, not his last book, his most uh yeah his book on Gaza is yeah yeah Yeah, yeah. uh but um and uh and the head of the red cross whose job it is to visit to visit uh disaster zones and humanitarian crises and war zones said it was the worst destruction he'd ever seen ever in his life uh and then and and now the amount of homes destroyed is, I can't remember the exact number, but obviously tens and tens of thousands more of that uh, that gets to your point about displacement. But in those breaking the silence interviews, every Israeli, uh, every is uh, most Israeli soldiers that were interviewed, they claim the same things. And these are not ideological people where they are. Certainly they're not ideological yeah. uh, towards us, you know, right. ideological extremists in the opposite direction in many cases. Um, talking about insane amounts of destruction, never, uh, you couldn't see anything. We destroyed everything. It was crazy. Uh, words looking crazy and insane keep coming up. And then notably in many of these accounts, multiple of them describe how in all of these, uh, uh, expeditions of insane destruction, they never saw a militant. They never saw a Hamas fighter, uh, never once, and and so they're just pulverizing civilian areas. There's not even a pretense in many cases that they that they have encountered uh, militants. Yeah. And you know, even now, I read the mainstream coverage around, uh, about this, and I see the word like uh, there were. Uh, you know, heavy exchanges between Hamas in this particular mission that the yeah. is on and they're battling in the streets. Um, who are they battling with? Yeah. I, uh, the, I, so, so I also say hey, uh, the other day there was an Jemt article. Is, uh, Jemt is correct. It says uh, uh, destiny is wrong. Human shielding requires specific intent, meaning the act of placing military objectives near civilians has to be done specific intent to prevent attack. In fact, I think the sort of standard, uh, you know, legal definition of the crime of human shielding is directing the movements of civilians to uh, protect military operations. Right. So uh, the, the sort of thing that, uh, you know, the sort of thing, in fact, that uh, the IDF used to do pretty openly until the uh, high court there told them they had to stop. And now it still does sometimes happen where, uh, for, you know, for example, they'll force Palestinian civilians to walk in front of them uh, so, uh, so, th- so they won't get shot at. Uh, and it continues placing uh, military objectives near civilians, not human shielding. 
it's an entirely separate war crime of uh, taking not taking precautions uh, in attack to prevent civilian death. It's not a sexy term, though. Uh, that's all totally correct. But the other thing I did just want to point out about this clip is that um, Destiny uh, is is going from his war is hell, things happen, civilians die, right? Defense of Israel to jumping very quickly to this whataboutism about Hamas. Now, in this particular case, I mean, again, the, the human shielding uh, claim, you know, I, I take Amnesty International more seriously than I take Destiny on this, but, uh, but like, but also it doesn't matter, right? Like, because uh, you, you have like his larger point, right? It's like, oh, any war crime, you know, you could accuse Israel of, you can get accused Hamas of. It's like, okay, let's just pretend for the sake of argument that's true. All right, why do I care? Uh, they, I'm an American citizen. My country is not sending 2,000 pound bombs to Hamas to kill Israeli soldiers, civilian, you know, civilians and children, right? If they were, I'd be against that, but they're not, right? So I, I don't know why, like, any, you know, war crimes that are committed by Hamas are supposed to be relevant here any more than if we were discussing, you know, if this were a debate where like there was like a Serbian guy who was there who was defending Serbia's war crimes in Bosnia in the 90s. And, yeah. you know, and his American co-debater was like, oh, well, you know, Croatia also committed a lot of war crimes. It's like, OK, right. Like, uh, what? It, however much or little truth there is to it, it has absolutely goddamn nothing to do with anything. You have been watching free public content from Give Them an Argument to access every single episode of the show, the main show on uh, Monday nights, all of the streams, all of the uh, debate breakdowns, all of the patron-exclusive post games on Monday nights, all of the patron-exclusive bonus episodes every week, and much, much more. Go to patreon.com slash Ben Burgess. I cannot resist ending this with, don't be foolish.